Um, welcome everyone to the first of New York City Audubon's 2020-2021 Winter Lecture Series. I know it's not quite winter, but with Thanksgiving nearly upon us, tis the season for lectures. I am Katherine Heinz, the Executive Director of New York City Audubon. And uh, let's see, I'm Katherine Heinz, the Executive Director of New York City Audubon. And I thank all of you, our members, our friends, our followers, for helping to keep New York City Audubon going through these very strange times. Your passion for birds and your support for their protection has made all the difference to our survival. We are still here fighting for the birds. We especially tonight thank two of our champions, Claude and Lucien Bloch, for their support of these lecture programs for many years now. They and we want you to learn more about the birds we work so hard to protect. Our lecture committee and staff have put together an array of interesting programs this year brought to you via Zoom rather than in person. I thank you all for your patience with the technology. There are trade-offs. We assure you that no one arriving late will walk in front of you or need you to move your coat. And we're just thrilled that nearly 450 people have registered for tonight's presentation. Well, more than we ever could have welcomed uh, Madison Avenue, even without the social distancing guidelines. So I'm looking at the participant list and I can see that number ticking up. So I think there are still more people uh, popping in. But tonight we had something really special. Hub Osterland, a Safina Center fellow who spent her career as a nurse practitioner offers us Les on Albatross, their style and story. Hob, a sixth generation Hawaii resident, was inspired by Carl Safina's book, Eye of the Albatross, and she founded the Kauai Albatross Network. She attended UC Berkeley, receiving a bachelor's degree in ecological geography. She also holds a master's degree in nursing from the University of Hawaii, Manoa. And in addition to being a Safina Center fellow, Hob is the author, author of Holy Moly, Albatross and Other Ancestors. And in 2018, she produced the Telly Award-winning documentary short, Kalama's Journey, that we'll be seeing tonight. And before I hand the helm to Hob, I would like to put in a good word for visiting the Hawaiian Islands to see these magnificent birds when we can travel again. Inspired by a piece about the Lanai Cat Sanctuary by the American Bird Conservancy, I visited for the very first time in 2018 and I saw a Laison albatross. It was spectacular and it was huge. A longtime partner in our bird building collisions research and advocacy in New York ABC is working on creating a new albatross colony on the tip of Molokai. Their Kauai work mostly supports Hawaiian petrels and Newell's shearwaters and includes predator-proof fencing to make the nesting areas safer for albatrosses and other nesting birds. They also advocate for lead paint and invasive plant removal from nesting habitat on Midway Atoll. Now I can tell you we'd originally intended to pre present tonight's program in person with ABC, but alas, here we are on Zoom. If you'd like to know more about this conservation work and the Kauai Albatross Network that Hob founded, I'll post links in the chat. And now, on behalf of New York City Audubon, I bring you Hob Osterland. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Danielle, for the great work you're doing to make this happen. I'd also like to thank my good friend, Jessica Weber there in New York City and her friend, Dr. Claude Block, obviously already mentioned, um, but they were the connections to making this happen. So here it was, we were going to have this conversation in person. And so since we can't, I guess one of the great challenges of COVID is for us to find ways to feel like we're in person even when we're not. So I'd like to make this a conversation. I'd very much like for you to Use the Q&A, that uh, section, that little block in the lower uh, right part of your screen. Use the Q&A rather than the chat when you have questions to ask. That way I can see them and answer them as time allows. 
uh, don't wait till the end. A any time that you have a question about anything I've said or a uh, comment to make, please do. And we'll do our best to make this feel like a conversation. Like we're in a room together with 400 or 500 very comfortable seats, nice and perfect temperature inside, and you're sitting next to someone who's just as enthusiastic as you are about these magnificent birds. Or in Hawaiian, the word is moli. So let's have the conversation. Uh, at the end, we'll also uh, have three prizes. There was a contest that was announced to the people who were registered early on, and so we have three winners to announce. <laughs> and the first question, what's the plural of albatross? <laughs> the word albatrosses sounds really terrible, doesn't it? So usually we use albatross when we say, if there's a whole bunch of albatross in the field, you'd say, look at all those albatross. But if there are several species of albatross, you might say, that's, that's several albatrosses. But you don't normally get a chance to see that because you don't normally see more than one species, except in very rare places. But thank you for that question. So uh, I want to begin by answering a couple of questions that in, uh, invariably come up when I give this presentation. And one of the questions is about the expression albatross around the neck. People often think that albatross are a burden because of that expression, but the expression comes from the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Some of you might have read in high school literature. Uh, the rhyme of the ancient mariner by Samuel Taylor Cooleridge uh, talked about a ship that was lost at sea. It was stuck in some icebergs and uh, an albatross came and showed them the way out and they got free. And uh, the albatross stayed with them. But then one of the mariners got drunk and shot the albatross, killed it, and the wind all died down. And that's how you got the expression, water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. Uh, and so as they lie there dying of thirst, they force the mariner to wear the albatross around his neck as a symbol of human ignorance. So the, it's not the albatross that is the burden, it's the human mind that's the burden. And I think we all know all about that with our own minds. So. That's that story. The other, the other question that I'm invariably asked is how I got to albatross in the first place. So I do want to mention that I, in, back in the 1970s, I had a dream. And in that dream, I saw my ancestor, Martha Warren Beckwith. Martha Warren Beckwith is the author of a book called Hawaiian Mythology. She was an anthropologist here and wrote this book called Hawaiian Mythology. She died when I was 10 years old. I didn't, I probably was around her maybe five times in my life. I didn't know much about her, but there she appeared in my dream and showed me her book. And because of that, I felt compelled to move to Hawaii from Oregon in the woods in a cabin to move to Hawaii. I couldn't explain to anybody why, but here I am. And shortly after I moved here, I visited Kauai, and there I saw my first albatross. And it wasn't until much later that I found out that in 1979, which was the year I moved here, in 1979 was the year that the first lace and albatross chick fledged in maybe a thousand years. So I don't know how to explain how those things happen. It could be just plain old coincidence. It could be divine guidance. It could be just anything. I don't know how to explain how the universe works, but that's how I got here, is by seeing those albatross, and they stuck with me. Uh, we already have um, some questions, and I'm gonna hold off on uh, each of those because we're gonna get to them. We're, talk we're gonna talk about um, some birds on Oahu and plastics and um, about Midway. All, all very good questions, but we'll, we'll get to those. Um, so, the, the inspiration that I had then to learn about albatross because of meeting them, I discovered, as you already know, that everything about them is superlative. They fly the farthest, they live the longest, you know, the oldest known wild bird in the world is named Wisdom. Now I think she turned 70 this year. She's a resident of Midway Atoll, um, was still laying eggs as of last year. And if you put her side by side with a three-year-old albatross, you can't tell them apart. So she, they show no sign of aging. Most people, mo and, and most women will say, well, at the age 70, you can have the baby making thing. You can have, have, making, have making babies. But 
I don't know, the skin thing, the ageless skin thing is pretty appealing. So they look ageless. But the thing about them, I think, is the greatest when you're around them is the love that they exude for each other and for their, their chicks. When you see parents with a chick, parents even with an egg, you'll see pictures tonight of the great affection that they share. Um, for birds that spend most of their lives, probably 90% or 95% of their lives solo, it's quite remarkable to think how adept they are socially. So they're the masters at social distancing and they're the masters at love. So what better role model to have? I wanna start uh, the evening with the film Kalama's Journey and that'll give you an introduction to the birds on Kauai and uh, some of what they're dealing with. And then from there, uh, we'll go into some slides and we'll have a chance to uh, talk about these questions that are popping up and have a chance to um, be together around this. So if you could start Kalama's journey, I'd appreciate that. Danielle? Laysan albatross. Everything about them is extraordinary. In the Hawaiian language, they are known as moli and are considered sacred. They navigate huge distances, sometimes flying for days over the seas without a single wing beat. On land, they dance for years before they choose a mate. Then their love for each other lasts a lifetime, which could be 60 years or more, longer than any other wild bird. They only need solid ground to raise a family. Fledglings aren't taught how to fish or fly. When they're ready to take flight for the first time, they'll have to figure it out for themselves. Midway Atoll, a small island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, is the mothership of these albatross, the place where most moly come from. But Midway is also a sinking ship and is destined to be submerged as sea levels rise in the coming decades. So where will these millions of birds go? The Hawaiian island of Kauai is the one place on earth where moli have chosen to nest among humans. And it may be one of their only hopes for survival. To me, they are, they are so important. They are so important to our culture uh, we hold birds in very high regard. Some of the, the most prized gifts that you can give someone, most prized awards, are feather lays, feather kahili, uh, things that symbolize very high achievement. This is a story about one chick named Kalama. In Hawaiian, Kalama means the light from a flame or enlightenment. Kalama's biological parents nested too close to a Navy runway. Because of fear that the birds might collide with airplanes, the eggs are carefully taken from parents who are at risk and then driven to safe nesting spots on the other side of the island where they are given to parents whose eggs are known to be infertile. Kalama's egg is placed in a nest with two mothers. Female nesting pairs are not uncommon amongst moli. These mothers accept their new baby without the slightest hesitation, and they dote on her from the moment she hatches. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology sets up a live streaming camera for the season, so people from all over the globe can watch Kalama hatch and grow. She quickly steals the hearts of more than a million viewers around the world. I'm very happy today, especially, uh, to be here in the district of Ko'olau. Uh, I'm here with some of the members of our Halo to experience this special place and to visit one of the protected uh, colonies of Moli. We were invited to, um, to name the newly hatched chicks or uh, baby Moli. It's a great privilege to 
watch them up close here today and um, it's been very entertaining just sitting here and being quiet and reflective and watching the little ones do their own little things and their own quirks. The albatross that fly across the sky remind me of the canoe that sails across the ocean. It was such a great privilege and opportunity to be here, <clears throat> knowing that we're able to engage and name Molly. It was the personal experience that I saw these birds display amongst themselves, but more importantly, is what it did for me. I don't know if anyone can even understand <laughs> what I'm saying because I witnessed that today in looking at the uh, molly that we had an uh, awesome experience to kind of take a look at. Baby molly face many risks, including predators like dogs, cats, and pigs. And there's never a guarantee that their parents will survive at sea and return to feed them. Kalama is fortunate. With high-octane meals from her moms, she begins to strengthen her wings. The older she gets, the stronger she gets, and the less she sees of her parents. They spend more and more time foraging at sea just to find enough food for their baby. They fly all over the North Pacific, from British Columbia to Alaska to Japan. Soon it will be Kalama's turn to take the same journey, although no one has shown her how to fly. Why does one baby bird matter so much? It's because these magnificent birds are facing the biggest threat their species has ever known. Global sea levels are rising. When the nesting grounds at Midway Atoll are submerged, millions of moli will be left without a home. Kauai is safe for three reasons. It has elevated bluffs. There are no mongoose that plague the rest of Hawaii. And it has people who care. Kauai could be their Noah's Ark. Maybe what the mole is doing is actually talking to us, teaching us, inspiring us of what this place is that out of all the places that they could choose, maybe it's reminding us how special this place is and reminding us that we need to care for it. The time has come for Kalama to leave her beautiful island. Even though no one has taught her how to fly, and she has only one chance to get it right. Once she flies, her feet won't touch ground again for several years. If she's successful, she will return home to the very place where she hatched to start her own family and hopefully will lead more moli back to Kauai. Kalama's journey is just beginning.
Great, thank you so much. Uh, you know, <laughs> I've seen that film so many times that it still brings tears to my eyes, seeing Kalama Fledge. It's quite an extraordinary moment and we'll get another chance to see one more in the slides. Uh, I do want to address, uh, we have six questions here. Uh, three of them are about seeing Albatross again. Two of them are asking about the live streaming camera that we had here for five years here on Kauai. Uh, and one is about uh, whether Midway will open up again. And my answer to all of those is I don't know. Uh, there are lots of variables that need to happen at the same time. Lots of stars need to align for those things to happen at the same time uh, for, for there to be uh, a, a camera or for there to be visitation at Midway. It takes resources of all kinds and it takes the birds and it takes uh, an absence of harm and it takes all kinds of things. So I don't know, but we do have five, we had five years of live streaming and I'd love to see Midway open up again myself. I would love to go again. Question came up, has Kalama returned? No, she's three years old and probably we won't see her till she's four or five. Somebody asked about uh, albatross in the Galapagos. There are uh, 21 species of albatross in the world and they are similar in many ways. The Laysan albatross that you see here is not the biggest, that's a six and a half foot wingspan, uh, but there are ones that are more like 11 and a half foot wingspan. If you go down to New Zealand and see the birds that like the royal and the wandering albatross. Um, there's a question about uh, plastic uh, and we will talk about that a little bit later. Uh, how do they rest and eat if they're over the ocean for years? They actually can fly, I mean sleep while they're flying. They can turn off half their brain and doze. Uh, and actually some research on frigate birds showed us that uh, these, these uh, seabirds that are at sea for a long time actually can get deep REM sleep in just a minute. Um, in the, kind, the depth of sleep that, it, that we need takes an hour, they can get in just a minute or two. Uh, so, but when they're on land, when they come back and land, they do sleep eight hours a day. Uh, but at sea, they have to get it in little, little bits and pieces. The North Pacific, where the Lace and Albatross goes, is a very, very big place. There's not anything to run into. Um, so they, they, get, they get naps as they go along. They can sleep on the surface of the ocean too, uh, but they, uh, there are sharks below them. And so that's probably the only predator that they have any wariness of. Um, are there, uh, someone just asked if they're, these are the same albatross you saw nesting at Kaana Point. Yes, exactly the same species. Um, please advise what it means that she will not set on land until she returns to Hawaii. Uh, so albatross, after Kalama fledged, just using her as an example of all the chicks, uh, she will stay at sea and not touch ground until she comes back when she's four or five. So she'll be airborne or on the ocean feeding for those four or five years. And then when she touches ground here, it'll be the first time that she touches ground in all that time. Amazing. Um, and okay, we'll hit on a heartbreaking thing for a second. Somebody asked about an update. Uh, Karen asked about an update of the legal resolution of a massacre of albatross at, in Kaana Point on Oahu. Uh, that's when humans were the worst predators. Some, some uh, young uh, high school kids went out there and massacred some albatross and they were highly educated. They went to Punahou School. They were the same school that Barack Obama went to. They were highly educated. They went out there to do it evidently because they thought it was fun. Uh, only one of the kids was old enough to be tried uh, as an adult. The rest were they were all, the ones, the ones that were left in school were expelled from school, uh, but couldn't be tried as adults and their case was sealed. We don't know what, what kind of punitive action happened with them. And the gentleman who was tried in public, uh, Christian Gutierrez was his name, uh, sad, sad event for himself and his family. I hope, I hope they recover and that he finds a much higher way of being. He actually evidently filmed some of it even and he was in NYU film school at the time. It was a very tragic, tragic event. Um, so that, that was that story, that was several years ago. Um, if we can go to the slides, Danielle. So as you mentioned, as, I, as uh, 
Catherine mentioned to begin with, uh, I want to give a great nod to Carl Safina, who wrote Eye of the Albatross. This is Carl and his wife, Pat, and their daughter, Alex, when uh, they got married here on Kauai. You can't help but be inspired when you come to Kauai. And I do want you to come to Kauai, just not real soon. It's not a good time to do it yet. Probably not this, probably not the winter of 2021 either. Um, anyway, uh, they were here and decided to get married, and that's what hit that. So, blessings to them. You can't help but be excited about Lace and Albatross in flight. Um, every time I see them, I'm thrilled, and I've seen it now probably thousands of times. Um, they fly toward you. They fly away from you. They glide. They hardly use a wing beat. They can go, it's been recorded to go uh, seven whole days without a single wing beat. They're the ultimate go-with-the-flow flyers. They lock their wings like switchblades and just float them around um, using gravity and wind to find their way. It's, uh, it's called dynamic soaring. There's the Kilauea Point Lighthouse behind. <clears throat> the, the patterns under the wings of Lace and Albatross are all different, like fingerprints and snowflakes. None of them are identical. I can't tell them apart that way, but I have seen chicks start begging from a parent that's still in the sky, so maybe they know how to recognize them. I don't know that, but maybe. Somebody just asked how many are presently in existence. There are several million lace and albatross. They're the most numerous of the albatross species, uh, but, that, but Midway is their great mothership, and so you know when that goes underwater, we have a whole other situation for them. That's a black-footed albatross, gorgeous bird. Uh, does not nest here in the inhabited Hawaiian Islands, but does nest, nest at Midway. Uh, the lace and albatross nesting here in, in the Hawaiian Islands, especially here on Kauai, it's the only place in the world that they nest among a significant population of humans. Midway only has about 50 people living there. So the bird to uh, person, bird to person ratio is about, I don't know, 30,000 to one or something. Just exactly right. Uh, here on Kauai, uh, we see them um, nesting in neighborhoods. You'll see pictures of that. Um, they can fly at night. They can see perfectly well at night. Visiting each other and uh, they come back, what they do is come back here just this time of year. So this is a perfect time to be talking about them. Um, somebody just put what's the best time. So uh, they start, uh, when the pandemic is over between February, February and March will be perfect. So look at the foraging range. You see there, see the Star of Kauai and the Star of Midway. That's about uh, 1,200 miles apart. Midway is the mothership, where there are probably going to be 500, 600,000 nests this year. Their foraging range is that light blue area you see. So it's a huge, huge area of the North Pacific, all the way from the California coast, British Columbia, Alaska, Japan, Russia, huge area they forage looking for looking for food they're looking particularly for squid is their favorite meal um, they'll eat flying fish too and other and other kinds of fish but and flying fish eggs but what happens this time of year is they start coming back we haven't had them here now for since uh, july now they're starting to come back and the mates haven't seen each other probably in all that time they're long-term maters Many of them mate for life. I've seen some divorces and I've seen some threesomes. Uh, always two girls and one boy. Um, but they have the reputation of mating for life. When they get back together, they're very excited to see each other. They, they run to each other, eat, 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 talking, getting really enthusiastic. You'll see a video of the kind of thing that I mean. Um, then they're very affectionate with each other, nuzzling and preening having a wonderful time together. We can go ahead now, Danielle. Um, you see the nene geese in the background there. Those are the endangered Hawaiian geese. Uh, when these, these birds come to ground, just right about now, the geese get very aggressive with them. Um, they'll body slam them. They'll try to encourage them to go away because they're territorial. This is the beginning of nene nesting season too, so they don't like it. But the albatross uh, gradually under, begin to understand that they're bigger and will just sort of run toward them with their wings out, and that's enough to scare the nanny away. Next slide. They're all cuddly and cute with each other. Um, they just can't get enough of each other's attention. 
uh, we'll actually see a, a video of them having sex, what it looks like for an albatross, very different than it looks like for a songbird. Um, they, and then they'll, they'll snuggle some more and have sex again, and they'll spend the night together and snuggle some more. And what other species of animal can you think of that behaves that way? Certainly not your dogs or your cats. They're very excited to see each other. And then after the mating and after the snuggling, then the hard work begins because she's got to go back out to sea and get enough food and then grow herself an egg. An albatross, by the way, uh, ha oh, well, let's, uh, don't, don't start that quite yet, Danielle. Um, albatross uh, can, the female can hold the sperm and not use it. After sex, she can hold the sperm and not use it till she's ready. She can hold it for quite a long time, evidently. Um, but lace and albatross will hold it for uh, a while until they have enough food, they feel, to sustain themselves and their egg. And then they'll, it only takes a day to make an egg. So then they'll release the sperm to themselves and the egg will happen. So this is what happens after they reunite. And they're not a cooking bird, you see, the male is not a comfortable thing to do to try to cook. She's got to switch his tail from way, she's got to switch his tail the other. And then she'll be able to handle the whole idea of weight bearing on her back. Uh, because that's all she can handle. Um, and most of the time, that's enough for what they call that cloacal kiss, that, that opportunity for the sperm to jump from his cloaca to her cloaca. Of course, there is no penis. There is just a, something that looks sort of like a pencil eraser. So they touch their erasers and that sperm, it's gotta be ready to go. Like, go dude, it's time. And then they'll hang around for a little bit more. They might have sex again. And then they go out to sea. He's gotta bulk up too. We'll talk about that in a minute. Go ahead. And then here's the egg laying. So she gets into an awkward posture, loops her wings, and so trying to. Egg is much, much bigger than her cloaca, of course. Left to the right. I don't know why they do that. I've seen them do that before. And then, oh, out it comes. The egg is all uh, shiny and soft. That's the lightest touch. The, the tip of that bill is the business end of the bill. It's the end that tears the flat, but she's not going to touch the egg shortly. Um, I saw a note there that said that they can't, someone can't hear me over the, over the audio, so maybe we can just turn down the volume on all those videos, Danielle, if that works for you. So uh, then what happens after, uh, while the, the mates are reuniting is here come all of the non-nesting birds, the ones that are too young. You remember I mentioned to you that Kalama isn't going to show up here until she's four or five. Well, the birds don't usually choose a mate till they're more like eight or nine years old. So, so for three or four years, they'll come for part of the season <clears throat> and they'll just dance their brains loose. They'll jump up and down and they'll whinny and they'll moo like you saw already on the screen. Uh, and it's quite a cacophony of young birds. You can't tell the age by looking at them. You can't tell the gender by looking at them for sure. Although the, the males tend to be a little bit bigger their heads tend to be a little bit flatter. If you see that one that's standing the tallest, uh, his head look, that bird looks like a male to me. His head's a little bit flatter. The female heads are a little bit rounder. Um, but they're very entertaining to watch as they learn the dance steps that a place an albatross needs to entice a mate. And once they have chosen a mate and see each other again, they ha have very coordinated dances. Next slide. 
Uh, they sometimes don't know quite what to do. This is a teenager mounting the wrong end. Uh, they know they want something and they're not exactly sure how to get it, but they will try to get it, whatever it is. Uh, and also they'll do the same with nesting. They'll, they'll sit on a tennis ball, they'll sit on a mango, a coconut, um, as if they are sitting on an egg. They like to practice. When we have abandoned eggs here, the teenagers will sit on them. But uh, and sometimes they'll flirt with decoys. That's okay. Yeah, they'll go up to decoys and, and act like maybe that's somebody they could ask out, but it doesn't end up going where. There is a story actually about, about a bird who chose a, a, a decoy for a mate. And uh, I was at a, talking at a library one time when the lady, when a lady stood up and said, how can you say they're smart if they choose decoys for mates? And I said, I don't know about you, but I made some bad choices in my life and I'm smart, so I can't blame them. Next slide. They get into this almost trance-like state when they're sitting on an egg. So you see the birds uh, behind the nesting bird in the center are teenagers that are flirting, but the one that's right in the middle with the most light and the one on the lower left are sitting on eggs. And they get into this deep kind of, um, almost a meditative trance, they look like. Almost, you almost can hear the om, the, the hum coming out of them as they sit there in this quiet, quiet state. The female will, will uh, lay the egg and then the male's turn is to sit on it for sometimes as long as a month. He'll fast that whole time. He won't go even one inch away from the nest. He'll stand and turn, but he'll fast and just take his turn while she goes to, to regain the calories that she lost while she created that egg. Okay, next slide. Now this is a video, if you could keep the volume down. Um, this is a video, this is at Midway. Uh, you can see the nesting there is made of sand often, uh, and they do try to drink rain a little bit. Uh, and you can see the bird on the left trying to uh, um, reconstruct the nest a little bit after the water. They pick up little tiny grains of sand and build the nest. It's quite remarkable. Here in Kauai, they don't nest in sand. They nest in uh, something that we call ironwood, which is a type of, uh, has a type of branchlet that they use for social exchange as well as for making their nests. Okay. Okay, this is a video too. Before you start that, let me just tell you, because um, I do want the volume on this one. Um, a very common question that I get is how the females respond to having their eggs taken away. If they have an infertile egg and we give them a fertile egg, how do they respond? And here's a depiction of that. Go ahead. <laughs> So you took my baby and you gave me a new one? Okay, I'm cool with that. That's how they act. They don't spend a second in resistance about this new baby they've been given. Next slide. So 61 or 62 days later or so, the egg hatches. And it takes the chick as, as long as three or four days to break out. Uh, they'll, first, you'll see a little concavity in the egg, and then after that, you'll see a little tiny crack, a little hole. Uh, the parent, you can see in that, you see the tip of the parent's bill there. It's, it's razor sharp, but they won't help the chick at all. They might peel back a little tiny chip of that egg, but they won't help the chick break out. Um, the chip, chick actually hatches by spreading its shoulders, has to kind of break out by spreading the shoulders apart and um, making it making the egg crack apart. And then the chick has to finish that hatching. It's kind of the first tough love we got going on here. Uh, I've been forgetting to scroll down. We've got 20 questions here. Uh, do you have a way to monitor individual albatross? I see some banding. Yes, all of the chicks on Kauai are banded by the state wildlife people. And so um, it's, it's, uh, it's a way that we can keep track. It's, I don't, 
uh, the banding itself uh, by skilled teams only, they only get held for about 20 seconds or so, and then uh, the chick is put down right away. And then we can recognize them from then on. And it really helps us understand survival and helps us understand who's with whom, um, whether there's changeovers, all kinds of things like that. So yes, their banding is correct. Um, somebody, uh, Jane Stern, hi Jane. This is not a question, a comment. I've seen this film from its beginning as a concept to fledging as a film and each time it's so moving. Thank you. How do they feed? Are you talking about the chicks feeding? Uh, they get fed by their parents. Um, you saw in the film, the, chi the adults themselves feed by, um, by bobbing on the surface. They're, they, they're looking for squid that are at the surface. Some squid will actually spawn to the surface of the ocean. And so that's a smorgasbord for them. Uh, they, don't, they can't dive. It's way, they have way too big of a wingspan to dive, but they can go a little bit down as they bomb. Do the chicks practice flying before leaving for good, says Nancy. That is short trips and return to land. No, not at all. They can, they'll take little um, flights on the ground, meaning they'll lift off and maybe go a couple of feet. Sometimes before they fly, they'll go as far as maybe 20, 25 feet or so. But no, once they jump off the cliff, that's it. They get, the one, get one chance. Hi, Val. Val's Val Gebert. Can you distinguish the sexes visually? No, or by the bands. Just as I mentioned, you can tell the shape of the head or the size of the body. The males tend to be bigger with a flatter, kind of more triangular head, but not always. I've seen female-female pairs where one of them has a more triangular head too. So you can't tell for sure. How beautiful. Thank you so much. Do they flock together on the ocean? Are they solitary? They're known to be solitary. Although, you know, I don't know that we've ever actually had a whole bunch of them, um, enough of them with GPS on them to know whether they get together some. Um, they certainly will gather in the waters around the Aleutians, for example, where there are ship, uh, uh, fishing ships where they throw off the stuff they don't want, and the albatross will certainly gather around that. But they're a solitary bird. They don't, there's not a, such a thing as a flock of albatross in general. I did hear the expression once that a group of albatross is called an impossibility. I don't know, I've never seen that since, but it does seem true. I, I only see them coming and going solo with rare exceptions. Do they fly into the Northern Seas to a location or is their territory less specific, says Nancy? Um, they are, they fly, they fly um, wherever there's food. They have a really good sense of smell. Um, they can they can smell fish from about five miles away. The, the tube nose that you see on their nostrils there, they have a tube nose. Uh, maybe you can move to the next slide and maybe we've got a picture of that that we can see. Um, they have tube noses and in their, in their tube noses, Okay, we'll uh, go back one, I think. No, I'm sorry, next one is good. Yeah, um, okay, stay there for a minute if you would. So you see the tube noses on the adults there? So those, those, have, those nostrils actually have several purposes. They can smell through them, they can breathe through them. They can smell fish from five miles away. They can tell when a storm is coming. Um, they, they also desalinate. They, they have a, a desalination gland up, in, up higher above their nose that they can drip salt out of that nostril. Uh, and the fourth thing that's super cool, I don't know if any other bird has, they've got a speedometer up in there. So they, it's like a, a pitot tube or a pitot tube in an airplane for the pilots out there. It's a, it's a way of telling how fast they're going, which they need because they, they bank completely vertically when they're flying. So they need to know that they're not going to lose lift. They have to be going fast enough. Uh, let's see. So we've answered a bunch of those. Okay. So the parents will stay with the chicks for only a first couple of weeks or so. And then they used to go through what we see is here is guard phase. So uh, in this guard phase, uh, they just kind of hang out with the chick. They make eye contact. They just, they block the wind for them. Um, but the chicks are completely uh, vulnerable at this point. Um, the parents by the time they're two and a half, three weeks old, both parents will be gone. And then the older the chick gets, the longer and longer the parents are away. Next slide. Uh, you'll probably never see this picture any other time. All albatross all over the world only have one chick and no exceptions, except this one. I, I, don't, 
I haven't read about any other exceptions, but this was a female-female pair nesting here on Kauai. Both their eggs were fertile, which means that they both had a moment with a boy. And we think it was the boy in the nest right next door who probably fertilized both of those. Um, the, the chicks only lived a couple of months because albatross can only ever raise one chick. It's too much food and too much work to fly all the way those thousands of miles to feed their babies to raise two. But we sure learned a lot about how two albatross chicks in a nest would behave together. Who knew? But of course, anybody that knows albatross would guess that they would be affectionate with each other, and they were. They spent the night together, they preened each other, they were adorable and a real heartbreak to watch not live. But I wanted you to see the possibility. The chicks get cuter and cuter. They sometimes do eat a piece of their shell, I suppose for the calcium, but it also seems like they're doing it just for fun. They explore, they start exploring, they start building new nests. Hanging from that chick is the amnion of the egg, the inner lining. Um, that's kind of rubbery and doesn't really decompose like the, like the shell does. But that chick was having a little nibble. And just by the way that amnion is hanging on the chick, it, it makes it look like it's holding it with its wing, but it's not. That National Geographic bought that photo from me. That was, that was quite a lucky moment to see that chick. Go ahead. And everything is so cool about albatross, they even poop artistically. Look at that making a whole sundial around itself. I don't know what that serves. They never poop inside their nests, even when they're just out of the shell. I've seen chicks that are there whose bottoms are just out of the shell and they won't, and they, they're wobbly as heck and exhausted. They still will, will poop outside of the nest. So, and then they create this kind of great design. Who knows what purpose that serves, but it's fun. Next slide, they get cuter and cuter. The, the older they get, they're, they're gonna get less cute in a little bit, but um, they, they're just wandering around, picking up sticks from the ground and, and watching everything that flies. They're really curious about butterflies, helicopters, everything that flies, they're really curious about. Good. Then they get to a stage where they start recognizing others and start even preening their own parents. This is, people buy this for a Mother's Day card just so you know, I don't sell my photos by the way, but just so you know, that's um, what people use it for. Uh, albatross don't know what a fence is. And so we're very careful with the property owners here to not suddenly put up a fence in the middle of nesting season uh, because they won't be able to, they'll try to shove them their way through it and they can't obviously fit. I've seen birds with their wings stuck in fences just like that. So we have to be really careful. They, they feel like if they can see their way through it, they'll just keep shoving. And albatross, by and large, don't have a reverse. So they just keep shoving and shoving until they either get stuck or they war make, um, create wounds in their shoulders. And so we have to be sure we don't um, set up the opportunity for this to happen. Next slide. Uh, here on Kauai, we don't have mongoose. I show you this slide, a horrible slide of a mongoose killing a Hawaiian, endangered Hawaiian bird. Um, we don't have mongoose on Kauai. As you heard in the film, that's one of the reasons why this is Noah's Ark for them, because of those three reasons that I mentioned in the film. One, they have elevated bluffs. Two, they have an absence of mongoose. And three, we have people who care. So then we need to think about what other predators there are. Next slide, please. Now, I'm going to show you this slide and uh, turn down the volume if you would. Uh, go ahead and, and run the video. So I, I show you this because I want to point out the fact that that um, albatross and Hawaiian birds in general don't have any idea what a predator is. This is a cat that I trapped in a colony. I had moved the trap so it would be in the shade so the cat wasn't in the sun. And the albatross approached and spoke to the cat in a very curious, unthreatened way. I just wanted you to see that, to know, see why they're vulnerable to feral cats. And, and I wanna stay on this cat topic just for, to just for a subject now, just for a minute, because it's so important. As you know, we're losing so many birds to cats. Um, and I had a good conversation about this with Catherine the other day, and I have a feeling that it's the people who love both cats and birds that are gonna help us with the solution here. Here in Kauai, there uh, is a, uh, a sanctuary being planned. They hope to be able to house 700 cats and we hope to be able to 
prioritize the cats, the feral cats that are closest to the endangered birds. So that's a really important topic, a really important place uh, for, for donations to go to, to, uh, to sanctuaries when they're built. We can't let the cats run free for the cat's sake as well as the bird's sake. Next slide, please. We have dog attacks and pig attacks here too. Um, that was a, a bird that we rescued, several birds we rescued one night after a cat attack, I mean a dog attack. Um, that bird lived. We actually had four birds, four out of five survived of the ones that we brought in that, that late Friday night um, and, is, and is now breeding. So we have, we have good rehab people here on Kauai. We just have to keep the predators away from them. Next slide. Uh, then the birds actually get to an age in which they have, look really goofy. And I'm gonna leave it on that slide for a minute because I see we have 36 questions. So I'm gonna try to hit a few here. Uh, let's see, can't hear you over the video. Only one egg per season. Yes, only one egg, always only one egg. If one egg fails, that's it for the whole year. Um, they're pretty tolerant of people, seems the camera was close-ish. Yes, they are very tolerant of people. They don't see us as enemies. Uh, but we still stay, we still stay, the, the recommended distance here is 15 feet. Some of them are more skittish than others. They all have different personalities, you know. Uh, do they look for their parents when they return? You know, that's a really common question too. We just don't know that. Um, we know at Midway that families tend to nest in clusters. So you tend to see related birds close to each other. But is that because they are related or is it that's because their GPS is so fine-tuned that says this is the spot I'll nest. In terms of survival, they really wouldn't have to recognize each other because they don't ever flock again. It's not like an elephant where you'd want to know the matriarch, you want to know your clan forever. Um, so I don't know. I mean, we've, we've, we did watch, we did happen to witness uh, last year a bird come home, a bird that it, that it, it was Kalo Kalo actually, KK, the first bird from the from the live streaming camera, we, she came back for the first time when she was five. And while we saw it watching her, we saw her dad come home. Um, they completely ignored each other. The dad was, had his new chick on his mind to go feed. So he went to that nest and she had dancing on her mind. She was just flirting up a storm with some other teenagers. So as far as we know, they didn't acknowledge each other. If one is lost at sea, will the surviving one signal its availability and promptly unite with another? I don't, we don't know a lot about how they communicate with each other, but when, when one dies, um, they will often choose a new mate. Um, we have stories of them, some waiting years to choose a new mate and some that d don't even wait that season. So it's everything. They're as different as each other in some ways as we are. Uh, how long is incubation? 61, 62 days. Uh, where do you... Get, uh, it says, where do you get the fertile egg? I think, uh, where do you fertile egg? I think that means where do you get the fertile egg from, from the missile range on this Navy base on the other side? How do you know it's infertile? We candle them, we put lights up to them to see. How can you, can you explain the lack of fear of humans? Um, well, you know, they don't know what enemies are. Uh, if once they've been banded, they get more skittish of us, they know what it feels like to be held and they don't like it. Um, if they've been chased by dogs, they'll be more skittish around dogs. Uh, but in general, they don't really see the world as a place where there are a lot of enemies. How do you determine the egg is infertile? That's the candling question again. Uh, this presentation, hi, Sella. Will the presentation be available to see again? Yes, it's being videotaped as we speak and it will be archived. Um, any fitted with devices so you can follow their movements at sea. It has been done by scientists, have put, have put uh, cameras on them and GPS monitors to see where they go. That's how we know that foraging range, that map that you saw at the beginning. Um, if the parents don't return to feed the chick, do humans help out? Boy, you know what? Um, not usually. It's a tough, tough situation. Uh, if, if the parents, if one parent dies at sea, uh, one parent can do it if it's late enough in the season, but if it's early in the season, one parent can't do it. Um, it takes somebody who's really skilled, who knows how to do it, um, with a great combination of nutrition and vitamins, and it takes handling, which the chicks don't like. Um, sometimes they don't make it. Um, costs a couple of thousand dollars to do. It's, it's a tough situation. 
Um, sorry, I was just asked already, how much does an adult weigh? Uh, you know, um, between six and eight pounds, the, f the female's lighter than the males. Any predators at sea, sharks only, on land that we have not introduced. No, they, they probably nested here for millions of years and there were no predators here whatsoever. Co the Hawaiian Islands had no land mammals except the hoary bat. So we had no foxes, no raccoons, no coyotes, nothing like that to predate upon them. So all of, all of Hawaii birds grew up, evolved over all these millions of years without a clue about what a predator is. That's why the feral cats are so harmful to them because they don't have any protection. Do albatross always launch and fly off the cliffs successfully? They do launch off of cliffs. They are not always successful. Sometimes they'll hit the ocean and then we see them far, far out and can't tell you um, what happens after that, but only 50% of them will make it back in five years. And only another 50% of those will make it to breeding age. So we consider every chick on Kauai important. We, last year we fledged only 100 chicks and midway probably more like 200,000. So we have a very small percentage of them, but we have, we have that high bluff that's gonna protect them from the ocean. Are there feeding ranges? Katarina says, feeding ranges changing over the past years due to various changes in the ocean environment. Uh, there, yes, probably. And we ha we're having lower reproductive success these last couple of years. It, we don't know all the details about that, but it's undoubtedly related to, at least in part, to the food in the ocean, the acidification, the plastics, all of that. Um, long line fishing and being caught inadvertently. Are towers being used to track individual birds? I don't know. I don't know what that is, a modus tower being tracked uh, individual birds. They, they, there are computers that are set up to follow the birds that, are, that, are, uh, that have GPS markers on them, but they don't stay on for very long. Hey, David, when they feed, do they alight on the water and then take off again? Yes, they do. They land on the water, they dabble, they pick up food, they might stay for a while. They might stay a little longer on the water if they're, if they're um, starting to molt and losing feathers. Hey, Auntie Sutira, how much, Hey, or squid, that's the Hawaiian word for squid. Can a baby albatross eat in a day? Uh, boy, it, when you see them fed, sometimes I cannot believe the amount of food that is regurgitated to them or if they're being fed in a, by a rehab person, they take, I don't know, two fish, a squid, and then three whole 50cc syringes of food. That's amazing what they can hold. Somebody, Patricia says, we're enjoying having dinner with you and the albatrosses. Thank you, Patricia. <laughs> Judith, gray rectangle on screen. I see it too. I don't know what that is. Uh, how do you tell bands apart? Uh, they have a federal band on one leg, which is a metal band that you can't read at a distance, but they also have a plastic band that has lettering on it that, that you can read um, with your naked eye or binoculars, really easy to read. Uh, how much food? Um, maybe I already answered that. Corinne says, is there an expected timeline from when Midway will become underwater? You know, uh, it's happening faster than we think. Uh, I've seen several pro projections going on into the next century, but already waves are lapping up onto the, the shores, and that's where the black-footed albatross tend to nest, which is on the, right on the shoreline. And so those nests are being destroyed faster. That's one of the reasons why they moved uh, some chicks, some black-footed albatross chicks to Kaana Point on Oahu um, to have them grow up there and be imprinted there. Infertility determined by that candling. Is climate change a major factor in threatening the future of these birds and other albatross species? Absolutely, because of the sea level rising and the, sea, and the ocean warming. Why can't they use the food source from the ocean nearby rather than long distance for feeding, says Mary. So the, the ocean is much more fertile in cold water. So it's much more fertile up in Alaskan water than, than in Hawaiian waters. They can find food locally, but not enough of it. So that's the reason they have to go all the way to Alaska and all the way to the Northern Pacific areas to find food where it's more fertile. Um, comment, John Eric, I have seen albatross get stuck in Naupaka as well. Naupaka is a native plant here that they nest under and the branches can be very entwined and, um, and stiff, hard to get through. So sometimes 
um, and birds do get stuck in those too. As Midway sinks, what percentage can safely move to Kauai or elsewhere? We don't really know the answer to that. Um, Midway isn't exactly sinking as much as it is being, being um, deluged, right, by, by the sea level rise. So um, we don't know what they're going to do. We don't know where they're going to go. Um, there's lots of room on Kauai for them to come to and on, and on Oahu, two places on Oahu. Uh, they're working on, uh, ABC is working on a new site on Molokai. Um, and hopefully there'll be enough birds that have fledged from here that can then lead a bunch of other birds here, um, find mates and bring other birds here so they can learn a safe way. Um, any updates from Kiamanu in the 200, 2018 CAM? No, we're not going to see Kiamanu uh, until probably 2023. Um, uh, um, thank you. Compliments about my book. Thank you so much. Alicia says, do you bring any eggs from Midway to try to preserve some of those genes? No. Um, chicks have been brought, but not eggs. Eggs are very fragile to transfer, even to drive across the island. Um, I would think that the days it would take by boat or the, air, or the airplane would um, disrupt the eggs, make it too tough. Um, they, don't, they don't have the same hatch rate even as the biological eggs. Miriam wants to know, for those that have been monitored, how far do they fly a year? You know, people are guessing at that. Guessing, guessing at that. I just did some math the other day um, on a bird that I saw just two days ago that I hadn't seen for 22 months. And if you guess 200 miles a day, which is kind of conservative, uh, if you guess 200 miles a day, that bird would have flown something like 136,000 miles since we'd seen it last. So, you know, we're just guessing, but a long way because they don't, they're effortless flyers. They zero calorie flyers. So they can go a very long way without hard work and they can fast for weeks without food while they fly. Thank you, Diana. I feel like I got to spend the afternoon on the bluff with you in the albatross. That's great. That's the goal. Do we know how far they travel to gain food during nesting season? Okay, so talking about now nesting season, the, the adults tend to stay a little closer. Yes, the non-breeding season. Thank you, Heller. That's really true. Um, they don't go quite as far. Uh, of course, if they're non-nesters, they're going to fly all over that whole North Pacific, that map that you saw. But uh, if they have a baby, they're going to stay a little bit closer. Hey, Bree, will Albatross from Midway move to Hawaii? I hope so. That first, uh, chick, that first chick that fledged in 1979... Uh, for, and for the first time in probably a thousand years, um, that parent was from Midway, and we know it because it was banded. So um, why would they come all this way? Why would they come a thousand miles away from their family, away from their food source? They're, the females of, the, of albatross are the prospectors and pioneers, and so they're the ones that'll keep looking. Hopefully they'll come. What happens to the parents of the fertile eggs that are taken? They grieve and then they leave. Hi, Hog. Um, it's Danielle. Uh, thank you for answering so many questions. It's so yeah. wonderful. Um, I think there are quite, still quite a few questions in there and we are running a little short on time. Okay, okay. Oh, I so do I see. I wanted to okay. pop in and let you know. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, thank you so much. We're gonna skip the rest of the questions and finish off the slides and announce the winners and, uh, uh, what solution do we have for the rest of these questions? Danielle, do you want to, uh, we could have, uh, do you want to stay on for a little longer for the people who want to hear the questions? Um, or, yeah, or I mean, I could, I can, um, you know, if you want me to send them to you, I don't, you know, we can um, try to get people answers. Or I think okay. that, you know, perhaps a lot of these answers, people can go to um, your website that we posted yeah. earlier in the chat and and you know take a look there um and if some people of these are repeats too yeah and if people want to send me questions through eventbrite um uh -huh. they can send me questions that way and i'm happy to pass them along or try to get them answers um for sure well i'll end it with a joke from nick this is nick who says is it true that an italian species of albatross invented the calamari <laughs> okay so I'm so glad, thank you everybody for all your wonderful questions. Our time is short, so we're gonna, um, I'm gonna move the questions aside. We're going to uh, take a peek at just a, these, uh, these funny lays, uh, there's, a, there's a, like a feather lay. 
uh, Sandy Swift, you'll appreciate that in particular. That's that lei hulu that we have feather lays here in Hawaii and that albatross grew her own. Next slide. Um, they, they, they now know that they're the boss of the nene. Nene aren't the boss of them anymore, so they'll chase them around. Uh, but they're, they are getting ready to fly when they start looking like this. Next slide. They, got, they, they nest right on golf courses. They don't care about the golfers. They'll sit there and watch them. Uh, the nest sites are uh, not mowed around, so the, everybody knows here. Uh, there's a sign on the streets here in Princeville that say albatross crossing, so people slow down. Uh, and so we're used to them being among people here. Kind of wild. Next slide. Oh, there's one thing I didn't mention, the, about, back to plastics too. The um, albatross chicks puke up a bolus right before they fly. That's a typical looking one. It's gonna have lots of little plastic chips in it and lots of squid beaks in it. The more squid beaks, the better. Next slide. Uh, that's a collection from just one colony I made one year that you see all those little black things. They look sort of like um, the corners of uh, photo albums. Uh, you know, the, the things we used to put in photo albums, the black things, those the little tiny things around there. But um, boy, there's almost always a bottle cap uh, if you don't, if nothing ever stops you from drinking bottled water again, there it is right there. That long tube right there, I saw an adult puke up. That is as the size and the length of a toothbrush. Okay. Um, and so we're going to get to see a quick fledge here, just so you can see they actually went together. There's a whole other topic about alb 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 albatross altruism, but these two were helping each other along. And all of a sudden that one went. And if you watch the left side of the screen, you'll see they both flew at once. Watch the left side, and there they both are. They always go north, flying for the first time. It's a thrill to see. Next slide, okay. That's just a fun slide to look at. That was Janine and I off for, a, after an educational event, returning that um, taxidermied albatross, and Janine was putting on her lipstick. So I think it's a cute picture. Prizes. Uh, the first person who won first place in the guessing contest is Chris Brout. Chris Brout wins an autographed copy of my book, and I'll inscribe it just for you, Chris. So if you would please let them know who you'd like this to be made out for, to, you or someone else as a gift, I'm happy to do that. The second place is Norman Patterson. This was a guess about when the first albatross would return to Kauai this year. That person wins the story of Kaloa Kalua, Susan Durker's book. You can go check out this book on albatrossofkauai.com. And the third place person, Haruka Aoki, she wins a couple of stuffies, an albatross adult and an albatross chick. Okay. Wow, that time went by really fast for me. I hope it did for you. I hope next year we can do this in person. Thank you so much. Everybody's still hanging around. Thank you so much. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but I appreciate you being so present. Yay, I give you a standing ovation. Thank you, Hob, so much for uh, your wonderful talk. And um, thank you, everyone who came. Um, we hope to see you next, uh, next month for our next talk. I'm going to put a link in the chat right now. And um, I hope you have a wonderful day or a wonderful evening if you're here on the East Coast with us. Thank you, everyone. And bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Hob. Okay, bye-bye.